Hello, everybody. Hello, and welcome to another This Week in Startups. We move to a two-day format. We're going to try to do the interview on one day and then do the news, the Ask Jason, the Shark Tank, and all that stuff on another day. Let us know what you think of that. We're going to just try for a couple of weeks and see what happens. This way the show is not three hours long, two and a half hours long. Maybe we can do two shows that are 45 minutes or an hour at max. Um, thanks to Ustream for helping us as our streaming partner, of course. And uh, the next startup meetup, the last one was really successful. We had dozens of cities participate. So the next one is going to be on July 20th. But this one is going to be for European countries uh, in terms of when we do it. So here at Mahalo on July 20th in Santa Monica, we're going to meet on the West Coast at 11 a.m. So it's going to be like this week in startups brunch. We're going to have bagels. We're going to have lox. We're going to have eggs, cappuccinos, mochaccinos, whatever you want. And uh, we'll start at 11 a.m. If my math is correct, that means it'll be 2 p.m. in New York. D.C. and Boston, uh, Florida, and those kind of places. So you guys can have like a late brunch or a late lunch and meet in the afternoon. That's kind of cool. Have an afternoon meetup, uh, start the, uh, the, the evening early. Then if you add six hours to the 2 p.m. Eastern time, I'm pretty sure that's 8 p.m. in Europe. Uh, in fact, I'm positive it is. So that means all of our friends in Europe are going to be able to participate. We want to try to get Paris and London and you know, I don't know, Berlin or Munich or Amsterdam, all these places to tune in and call in. So you, the European company, the European companies, the European cities will get to pitch their startup companies. The best pitch uh, in your local startup will then get to be on the air. And we'll do this uh, startup meetup again. We had hundreds of people that participate in the first one. And we're going to try to do it monthly. It's kind of crazy. Um, if you want to ask a, a question or pitch your startup, you're going to email askjason at thisweekend.com. That's it. Just send your question with as much details as possible, your contact info so Long can call you up. Uh, the Open Angel Forum taking place uh, in San Francisco on June 24th. That's right around the corner. Uh, you can apply. You can basically send your pitch to openangelforum.com. Uh, you just go there, and there's a forum on the right-hand thing. And uh, if you present, you wind up presenting to 20 angel investors, Thumbtack, uh, was the last company that uh, I invested in at the San Francisco uh, Open Angel Forum. And they got, I think, Dave McClure and Shervin. Anyway, a couple of the angels up there invested. And so it's really working. We've got a bunch of people investing in these companies. Uh, with me today, Woody Sears. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Good to be uh, here. CEO and co-founder of Frog Dog Media, uh, which you may have never heard of, but you guys actually do some of the most popular iPhone applications out there. Uh, especially for kids. As a matter of fact, I think I actually looked at this. You're in the top ten uh, for kids or for books. Yeah, we have a couple of books in the top ten for both iPhone and iPad. Yeah, the uh, How to Pet Your Dragon, I think, is the the big one right now. How to Train Your Dragon. Train Your Dragon. Pet was your dragon. our our big yeah. one in April and May, and now um, Shrek ah, Forever Shrek After exactly. has has risen above, and that's yeah. our top book right now. And so, tell me, what what does your company do exactly? We produce and deliver via applications narrated picture books for kids. So our target audience is ages two to seven who are actually using our product and then who are actually helping and who buy our products are the moms and dads who are running errands, traveling on an airplane, times when they can't read a book to their kids. They can use their iPhone or iPad and hand it over to their kid and the book gets read to them as an alternative to DVDs or video games or all the other things that are out there today. Right. And so I can tell by the way you explained it, there's there's this little bit of um, resistance probably in the market like, oh my God, you're just putting your kid in front of an iPad and like, it is, uh, is, is that the... Um, do parents generally feel bad when they put their kid in front of it and say like, hey, you're going to read a book instead of me reading it to you or is it supplemental? I mean... Well, we, we never want to replace the paper books. I right. think there's a huge place for that. And essentially, we, we feel like we're offering something that's a little more guilt-free than handing over your iPad with a, a game or something right. on it. Because you are delivering a book. Um, there, there's some features that help them develop early reading skills. Um, they're getting the pages, the still images. It's not a flashy cartoon or something. So. Right. I think they can feel better about that. Yeah. I think that there still should be some 
um, reservation about how much you want to use it, no matter what kind of, you know, you want to reserve the amount of screen time per day for your kids, right. especially the age group we're talking about. It's mostly two to five, but up to seven. So it's not a it's not an effective way to babysit your child. Right. I, I don't seem to. I don't have a major problem though with a kid being in front of in front of a screen just in of that. You know, like in and out of itself. Because I grew up in front of computers and I turned out okay. Uh, but I guess there's a sort of maybe stigma that if you if your kid's using an iPad or maybe they're you're not parenting as well. Right. But I actually use it like I had the the had to train your dragon one. And I was showing it to London. My daughter's only five or six months old now. She's six months old now, which was five when I was doing it. And she was fascinated by it. Like, I mean, she looks at the iPad at six months old and it's like, wow, this thing is amazing. Um, kids are drawn to the iPad and the iPhone like nothing else. I mean, it's even more than computers, you think? Definitely. I mean, the user interface with the touch, it just, yeah. I mean, the screen draws them in. It's a beautiful screen, for one. Yeah. And then, two, it's so easy to interact with. And that's really was the impetus for the idea of my own children. Uh, my son, who's almost four now, he was just before three when we started the idea and started making our first app. And he was just a voracious reader, one, of paper books, and then got the iPhone, gravitated right to it. It didn't matter what was on there, just going through the photo album, him being able to right. swipe through the photos himself. And it's almost like they know how to do it, like, inherently. It's not like... I guess that's the genius of Steve Jobs is he's built an interface that just people understand inherently. Uh, it couldn't be more intuitive. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so let's take a look at the book. And now you said, while you set that up, that you purposefully don't make the books too animated and too crazy. You want to actually preserve the reading experience. Is this correct? Yeah, we're really particular about maintaining the intrinsic value of a book. We don't want to turn it into a game like we did. There's lots of games out there. There's some great educational games. Our, what we're focused on is delivering books in a digital format. Uh, we have experimented with some more features for kids to interact with in our most recent one with, that I'm going to show you. And we think of it more of a digital pop-up book. Um, so it doesn't take away from the experience. It's not, there's not animation, but there are ways to touch right. and feel. And of course, this is Shrek, Shrek and this is the latest after. Shrek that's just out in movie theaters, I guess. Yeah, Once came upon out March a time, 21st. there was a big green ogre named Shrek. He had bad breath, and he lived alone in a swamp. Everyone was scared of him. So you have the highlighted text, which helps with the early reading skills. Ha! Some hot spots, some of the characters when you touch their face, you get actual audio from the movie. Right. And then we've hidden Sir Squeakles <laughs> on each page, so you have to hunt him out. Right. So some fun ways to interact, but we feel it's still some things but you may then, find in a Shrek paper book. A right. uh, just Her a new fun platform to deliver it on. Fell in love and got married. So the the kid is not. They're still you're still having this Soon book experience without um, distracting them from the actual words and the highlighting of the words. Does this uh, is this technique proven to help them read better? Is this like a educational technique or is it just? It's an uh, educational t technique for early reading skills. They start, they hear, they're hearing the word and they're seeing it highlighted at the same time, so they're making those associations between all those letters together and being short. So, um, we'll just kind of flip a couple of the pages, get to a, a donkey quote, who's my yeah. favorite. While looking for Fiona, now it's interesting. stacks of golden syrupy deliciousness. Donkey Think saw a stack and you got of yummy in the background here. Yeah. Yeah. So when um, this iPhone app came out at the same time as the movie, day and date release, basically, like the same day? We came out uh, three days before the movie was in theaters. Three with, days before the movie was in theaters. With Dragon, we were out two and a half weeks before it was released in the theaters. With the full story. So how is that possible? Because you need time to build the application. Uh, is this some unique technique that you use? How, how do you get the story and the, and the book done right uh, at the release? So people who have young children take them to the movies are probably familiar with the movie storybooks. They come out um, and they, they go through the plot of the movie. And they are released in paper before the actual film comes out. Right. But they're never released with the actual stills from the movie. So it's recreated artwork that looks like the characters, but it's not exactly the same. And what the kids gravitate most towards is the characters that they know that they yeah. saw on the screen. 
Um, so never before has there been a movie storybook with the stills delivered at the time of release or before. So we were able to do that because of the digital platform. And um, it's, it's amazing because when they're finishing a film, the, the stills, the final stills and cut aren't ready about until about a month or two before the film hits the theaters. So they're constantly making these cuts and edits until then. Um, so for a print publisher, it takes them four to six months to get yep. the book printed in China and shipped to the U.S. Um, that's obviously too long of a lead time. So we're able to take those stills, build them into an application. We did Shrek in three weeks, which is a little short, more compressed than we'd like. Um, it was kind of a night and day thing. Uh, but but uh, we love the way it came out. And it's, it's great for DreamWorks. They were able to do something that they hadn't done before um, using this platform. And how do they see this when like a DreamWorks, I mean it's impressive that you got DreamWorks to give these like level of character over to a startup to go release these things first of all. So I want to understand how you got that deal, I mean that's just amazing. Um, but um, how do they look at this? Do they look at it as um, a licensing deal? Do they look at it as um, part of the creative? Is, do they really want to be involved in this? Like the, do they want to have creative input in how this is done? But what involvement do they have, and why are they doing this kind of stuff? Is, I mean, is, and is it material to them? Like, Shrek does hundreds of millions of dollars, probably. Like, does an iPhone app or an iPad app come up on their radar yet? Um, from what we hear, it's actually coming up on the radars all the way up to Katzenberg, who's the CEO. Um, they're paying close attention. Not so much revenue yet. We hope that that's where we're taking it. Um, but just as an overall experience of what their property brings, and they are very much a part of the creative. They want, you know, they want to approve and collaborate every step along the way of building the application. Um, they want to make sure it's consistent across their entire brand. So um, it's it's very much on their radar. Um, and back to the question about how we yeah. how we acquired that. Yeah. So we launched our first app April 2009, um, mostly with independent or self-published works. Right. And we're really to get able to gain some good traction. We were one of the first in the marketplace, the first to do a library of children's books um, in the app store. And so we, and we built something, a platform that we can deliver these books that makes it uh, very straightforward for us to build additional books. And so you've got some sort of a template. You, the, the the second book doesn't cost as much as the first, and the, exactly. it gets cheaper as you go, uh, or more efficient. Right, and we were very thorough about about the user interface. Obviously, we have a great operating system to work work with here, and we were very careful about how it would run when the two year old is is taking it. So by design, it's very simple and easy for them to use, which is great for parents because they're not getting the phone handed back to them. Ah, right, unless uh, it rings. Right. <laughs> Which is a uh, part of the problem, I guess. That can be. Um, there's some it's a little coaching involved there, probably, yeah. or going into airplane mode. Right. Um, you know, if oh, you're right. out with you the put kids. Put it in America, uh, airplane mode. Right. And then you're not going to take any I have to learn calls. all these tips, because I don't, is that, that's a really good one. You put yeah. it into airplane mode, and then you don't have to worry about your kid. Sending some emails what out. The, what about the main button? Is there a way to turn that off? The main button's always the main button. So the, if the kid's playing with them, they hit that main button, they gotta, you got to get them back into the application. Yeah, we've uh, knocked on Apple's door a couple times on that one, and we haven't made much progress. And a lot of the kids' app developers would like to see something to lock that down, but um, like not available in the operating system uh, at this point. But um, yeah, the under, under two years old, I think that's a favorite button. Yeah. Um, even if my daughter's in an app she really likes. She'll press that button and then right. go back into it. It's just too tempting, I guess, yeah. the buttons. Well, it's the only button on the device, so right. it's kind of hard to, to miss. I wonder if they, has Apple come out with anything yet to sort of seal off the experience within the device and say, like, I'm going to lock down just these 10 applications in this one folder. I mean, they don't have, they have folders, I guess, in version 4. Right. But would you be able to put it in a folder and say, I only want this folder to be opened unless you put a password in or something like that? Not yet. Not yet. But we like, welcome it. <laughs> yeah, uh, it seems this seems to be an issue. Like yeah. uh, when you when you have kids using these things, uh, and I guess they have the ability to lock off the internet too. Uh, Steve Jobs has been pretty clear about wanting it to be family friendly, friendly as a device. And if you want the open crazy web, go on the browser. Right. Um, 
But how, how has it been in terms of getting these things through the app store? I would guess since it's a children's thing and it's a, a brand name that everybody knows, you, you must have no problem getting through the app store really quick. Yeah, we were able to uh, to breeze through. There was a point, I think, where they were backlogged right before the iPad launch. We were backlogged yeah. with every application, but um, we get through. Usually, it's 24 to 72 hours we're seeing approvals Wow, on most of our apps. Um, so it's not like a major issue for you guys? No, it hasn't been. Uh, they, you know, there's some things that change along the way, and we, you know, they had us regarding APIs, and and uh, I think it affected everybody for a moment there, and you know, we worked around it, and now we're we're back on on track. So, I, and and back to that platform, we we created something simple, very book-like, that attracted DreamWorks attention. They actually reached out to us. Right. regarding the deal and they, they approached a few other app developers and and they liked our model and what we created and um, so that was very fortunate and you know just it, it really helped build it from into a business from what it was before it was a great project and yeah. uh, with the other two founders we were having a lot of fun with it even if it was just for our own kids and right. the sake of having an app and um, that really where where we saw it going but the fact that we proved it where they wanted to come to us was amazing and kind yeah. of one of those things if you and build so this, it. When this started two years ago, sorry to interrupt you, you were basically working for somebody else, right? You were you were an entrepreneur. This is your first entrepreneurial venture. Yeah. And so you guys started this at night or something? Yeah, we were doing it on our downtime. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been great in that sense and I think, you know, if you're building something that you would love to use, your kids would love to use you know, there's liable to be a market for it. So. And so how, how soon bef between when you launch your first application and you get a phone call from DreamWorks? Is that like a year? We, we launched in April. We got a phone call from them in November. So less than a year. Yeah. Six months later, you get yeah. a call. And now this becomes actually a real business. You've raised venture capital or anything for this business? Nothing. We're opening the doors to Angel ah. here soon because there's a lot of other interested licensors and ah. there's some great content out there, some of the premier um, preschool age content that's on TV and movie um, is expressing interest and we're starting to go after solicit them now yeah. and uh, I think it's it's a good opportunity for funding just so we can pay the guarantees on the licenses yeah. and uh, really ramp up the business. And that's the key to getting a big character like that. You have to tell them we're definitely going to make this much so here's a check in advance. We're taking the risk. That seems, yeah. That's the uh, that's the model of most of the industry for licensing. Yeah, and they don't see you as competitive with the books, other children's books out there because these are digital, and you're not competitive with the games because it's not a game. Yeah, and that's uh, really where we fit in. It's it's a complement to the books. I mean, a kid has the book on here. There's a good chance they're going to want to see it also. You know, as a bedtime story at home. This may be the bedtime story when you're traveling or on the road, but. Um, it's really a compliment to those paper book sales and their their strategy around apps is they'll this isn't so much to promote the movie rather but another way to monetize that brand they have they'll do a free app for each movie um, that's really out there just to get exposure and and create some buzz around there and what does movie. a free app do it's just like a couple of little vignettes or the, some sounds or for Shrek it's a roar app ah. uh, you have to you tap the kid until you make Shrek roar I got it. Um, for dragging it, you would breathe fire into the mic and you get yeah. it. Yeah, so they're like little cute one-off things, but yeah. you're not going to spend 20 minutes with it reading a book. Right, exactly. Uh, and so you haven't raised the angel yet. You're thinking about doing that. Uh, and then what does that do for you? Do you get to ramp this up and start doing dozens of these a year or something? Exactly. Yeah, yeah right now we're doing um, about three or four a month. Huh. And we, if we get the right properties, um, you know, it's all about the quality of content. We could be doing a dozen a month. And what about doing um, original books? Do they trust you with that, or is that sort of the next phase of this? You know, you have Shrek three that's come out. Would they let you do three point one, or would they let you do a story, or maybe they have like some extra scenes that didn't make it into the movie? Is are those kind of things starting to happen now, or are they just getting comfortable first with the licensing idea? I think they would certainly be open to it. I think um, the reservation would be around. Uh, actual selling a book like that that the most popular title is the movie storybook the one that follows the entire movie 
with kids, with our age group. Yeah. Uh, you know, adults, they like to see kind of the spin-offs and the extras and stories they haven't heard. Right. Kids love the repetition. They don't uh, mind hearing the same story over and over again. So there is a possibility of doing, uh, maybe you follow one character. Right. So you can do, focus more on that, you know. You Gingerbread just, cookie guy Exactly, or yeah. and you do the story around him in the movie and just use the, the shots focused on him. Ah, oh, that's an interesting idea. So you could actually make apps from their perspective and yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, and so, what do you what do you have to hit in terms of, or what what do these without? I, I guess you can't give specific numbers of because they're your clients, but what what type of numbers do these do in general? These hundreds of thousands, millions, tens of thousands. We're in the hundreds of thousands. Hundreds yeah. of thousands, and it's paid. Yes. And what do people pay for the Shrek or the? Dragon one. These the retail's two ninety nine. Yeah. Um, we've experimented with some sale pricing just to find what the elasticity is there. And um, yeah, I notice that sometimes app developers, I'll see an app go from, we'll say, pinball is a dollar is ninety nine cents this weekend, and it's you know, normally two ninety nine, and then you go back and it's two ninety nine. Sure enough, um, is that something that's really easy to switch? You can just toggle that in the app store. Or do you have to like upload a new app? And it's probably too easy to switch, Jason. Yeah. Um, it, you know, and I think it can be a little schizophrenic at times with the switching of all the pricing. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of it, but it is good to know what, you know, what the market will bear. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you don't need to submit a new binary. To, there are some things, to, in order to change some things, you need to submit a new version, but not for the pricing. You can go and change the description the pricing anytime. Huh. And it's almost instant. And have you learned anything about the pricing? I mean, $2.99 to me seems like a pretty good deal, price of a mocha or whatever, a Starbucks, and your kid's gonna watch it, I don't know, hundreds of times, I'm guessing. Did you guys, you guys track that? How, you, you don't know how many times people have opened it and closed it, or? We do, yeah, yeah. We, can, we can tell, and, and it, it gets used over and over again. Wow. It averages, you know, above 20 times. Wow. Um, and that's just in a short period, right? Shrek's only been out a few right. weeks, so. So if people are watching it dozens of times, it winds up being a nickel every time the kid watches it. Right. It's, it's nothing. Right. Um, so does that mean people would pay ten dollars for it or seven dollars for it? Uh, they are, and I mean, we think our books are a tremendous value. You look at a Toy Story, and Toy Story, Toy Story Two is eight ninety nine. Toy Story they gave away. So they and that was an interesting balance. They've done well both with the free and with the 899 iPad only version. Um, we've chosen so far. We want to make apps that work, run on both devices. We don't want to distinguish between the iPad, iPad and, and the iPhone. iPhone. There are some things that you take advantage here on the iPad, but you, we don't want to charge people twice for it. Um, Which I don't understand how the same application can cost. Why the iPad applications are all ten dollars, eight dollars, nine dollars? Right. Is it hard? It's not harder to make them. I think it was. Um, no, you're right. It's, it's not just harder bigger. to make them. Yeah. yeah, it's bigger so that it has to cost twice as much. Yeah, because it is about two and a half times the size. So two and a half times makes sense. And people paid more for the device, and they're hungry right when it came out. I think we'll see those prices level off a little bit as uh, as the yeah. device is around longer. Uh, Android even on the radar yet? Uh, is you, do you think that's got a chance to be monetizable? Are your, are your licensing deals for just the, are, are they as narrow as like the, the on the platform basis? Would you have to license it for Android? Or you, you have all mobile apps? We have all mobile apps. So every platform that exists out there today, um, including the ones that are coming soon, the Windows 7. And Android we actually did for Shrek. Um, we launched it just after the movie. The, the iPhone was our uh, OS was our priority, and it's it's just a fraction of the sales right now. Right. But we want to be poised and ready because we know that that's going to have a larger user base at some point, and and the App Store will, I think, figure out a way to present itself better. It's it's still a little quirky to buy yeah. apps in there, and I had a hard time buying them. an app. Yeah, yeah. You have to have a Google Wallet, I guess, or something, and. Yeah, I had to go on my. I had to basically go on the web and set up my Google Wallet or something, and then go buy it. It's a little kludgy, I guess. Yeah, and it's great for us in the sense that we can submit an app and it's there the same day. We yeah. don't have to wait too long with same Apple, second, but yeah. it's it's there whenever we want to put it up. The downside of that is there's 16 other Shrek apps, and none of them are licensed. Um, wow. And well, that was when we launched. I think DreamWorks is going and uh, cracking some skulls now. Or, yeah. Whatever they have to do to protect their IP, but um, 
that, I guess that's the downside of not having that monitored. Sure. Uh, I, I did notice that there was a lot of other intellectual property on there. Like somebody had done all the NBA teams at one point. Somebody had done a bunch of movie stars or something. I think, Who, who's doing these applications? Right. Like, oh, just some kid like you know building a website. Right. You know, like I built an app for this, and there's no clearinghouse of it. So, right. do you think they're going to add that to be competitive with Apple? Do you think that? Google will have like sort of the approved app layer and then unapproved, or have they announced anything like that? I don't know if that's necessary. I think once um, there's just more revenue coming in yeah. and more people are paying attention to it, those won't slip through the cracks because as soon as they go up, one of the executives at DreamWorks at the NBA is going to see that and yeah. give them a phone call or have legal send a letter. So I don't think that's what I don't think that's what's holding them back. Yeah. Um, the new HTC phones that are coming out, pretty big, pretty powerful, the new screen size, the new iPhone has the new screen size. Uh, just going to impact what you're doing in any way, just clearer resolution and more HD-ish? Uh, that, you know, that, the battery life and the screen are the, the big improvements for us. I mean, being able to deliver, these are movie size images that we're working with. So right. the higher resolution, the screen, the bigger the screen, the more beautiful they look. Right. Um, so that's encouraging for us to have them that much more vivid and jumping off the page. Yeah. Um, Battery life's that. gotta be huge though for you guys because the iPhone is dead constantly. I mean, I can't imagine, I have a hard enough time keeping my iPhone charged. Right. If you're having your kid play with it for an hour or two a day, these things must just die instantly. Well, back to airplane mode, you know, yeah. you get that 3G and Wi-Fi off and... It could last a little longer. Yeah. Right you can run you can run the uh, the screen for a while how, how much of the kid activity uh, do you think is using uh, the touch because it seems like every kid has an iPod touch now specifically because of apps uh, so I had one friend who had her twins with her and she just boom took out you know two I I uh, <laughs> iPad touches boom and these kids were just like zoned out right. <laughs> uh, and in fact she was carrying with her it was funny she had the little uh, charger set that charges two two phones at once once so that you could charge them both at the same time. Uh, um, is it a lot of uh, a lot of usage coming from the touch? Is it We don't see that much on the touch. I think ours our age group is still more of parent um, handing over their device. And when the iPad came along it was a way for mom and dad to get their iPhone back and now ah. they hand over the iPad, yeah. which is an interesting phenomenon. But for that age group probably, you know, you're looking at seven plus possibly those kids I'm not yeah. sure how old but uh, you know we've seen that yeah, tip the gaming industry on its head yeah just being able to get games for a couple bucks and always having something new and all the you know, the great feet with the accelerometer built in it's all in one device um, so what's next for you guys just more more of the same or is there some sort of big uh, win in the future I, I'm guessing that now you can charge for things inside the game have you guys even considered like selling avatars in the game or selling like an additional chapter in the you know or additional you know you, you buy the app once and you can you can upsell now correct inside the game yeah you can do the in-app in purchases and uh, we we haven't done that yet we've talked a lot about it yeah. um, we don't want that so far we think that distracts from the user experience if at the end of the book it's asking you if you want to buy the next book you know, yeah. your your four year old touches that, and next thing you know, you're in the app store asking yeah. for a password, and then you're handing it back to mom and dad. Uh -huh. This is to get those five or ten minutes when you need to finish up the grocery store trip, or right. you know, get on the plane. So it's you don't want that kind of interaction. It should be. So as an entrepreneur, you're actually thinking about the parents' feeling as opposed to your next sale. This is a very yeah, unique, think, uh, long term thinking. Yeah, well, interview. You know, just talking to moms, um, yeah. my wife, other moms out there. That it does get a little offensive for them if if they're using something as a tool for them and then it's it's not working in their favor and it's trying to sell them more stuff. Ah, so it's, it's working a, against them basically. Yeah, and that's how a lot of these upselling things work. Is like they sort of guilt your parents into buying you the next piece. Right. You don't want to just be associated with that sort of right. vibe for the time being. For the time <laughs> being, right? Until a partner <laughs> says, "Hey, we want to upsell the next." Right, and we do offer a way to go get more books within the app. It's yeah. just not that in your face. It's more buried in the settings. You can yeah. go get the paper version. You can go get our other books in our library. But I, th um, it's more for the parent to navigate to that than, yeah. than to throw it in the kid's face. Yeah. 
Uh, and so the iPhone app developer, I think that's pretty cool actually. You're usually you're thinking about like everybody who's uh, creating games, I don't want to single out Zynga with Farmville or We Rule uh, right. and you know the NG Moco guys, like it's like everything is about getting you into that social loop and right. trying to get you motivated to farm the next crop and buy the next item uh, and obsess about it. You're act it's actually interesting, you're trying to in, in a way sort of slow the process down and let the kids actually, you know, uh, enjoy the enjoy reading of the have, book. Yeah, yeah it's, it's kind of a... But you bring up an interesting point as far as the rewards. We see that maybe as our library grows, um, doing some incentives around reading and, and making certain levels and then getting some kind of reward. But it's not more of buying into it. It's just a way to kind of monitor and track what they're doing and maybe it's with their peers once we move into a little higher age group with our books. Ah, that's interesting. So maybe in a way the scoreboard becomes what words you know, how, what, how, how, what your reading comprehension is, exactly. these kind of things. So you yeah. actually take those same game dynamics and apply them to something virtuous like reading. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's very novel. Hasn't yeah. really been, has that been done before in the, in, in the, in the app space? I haven't seen it. Um, I haven't seen it in the app space either. Yeah. It's been done, you know, over summer school, you know, yeah. over the summer. Stars you try, are bored. Right, exactly. You know. So if we could do that virtually, um, we're, we're definitely weighing that and I think so it would be a cool way to interact. You're basically trying to win over mom as a marketing strategy. Is that the, is that your thinking? Because that sounds to me like a pitch to the mom. You know, that's like yeah. we're gonna we're gonna track how your kid is uh, doing against other kids and how they're doing, um, you know, how, how they're advancing themselves yeah. over the books. Is that is that the sort of uh, the, yeah, the marketing? It, it makes it yeah. Mom gets excited if, if you make it fun for the kids to read more. Um, so it's definitely mom first. She's the one who's gonna buy it. Yeah. Uh, sometimes dad. I mean, dad has these gadgets. Right. And uh, that may be a way they, they want to choose to spend time with their kids too. But, you know, it's mom first. Um, and we think those, from what we've heard, from our feedback, that's what appeals to her. I just had the greatest idea based on this. You know, Call of Duty, like, is an incredible game. Yeah. And uh, I was just thinking if my nephew had to, at the end of every one of those campaigns, answer some facts about history, and why not the history of war, you know, and the wars right. that have occurred to get the next level, to get the next weapon. It, it, that would be the first thing they would do is memorize every single right. you know, general and at what year the wars occurred and who was fighting who and why. Uh, it would be an incredible teaching tool. You could actually make the special objects something that you get by answering questions properly. I love it. Wow. Someone call out the, uh, I don't know who makes Call of Duty, uh, but pretty, uh, pretty interesting stuff. And also pretty interesting stuff, DNA mail, DNA mail. That's when I do the commercial. I try to do like an interesting segue. Uh, if you want to get hosted uh, exchange for your business, two ninety five a month, uh, ninety nine point nine million nines uptime. Uh, DNA Mail has been with us from the beginning as a sponsor, and it's much more economical to pay per user and not have any of the costs of your servers. You guys have a startup; you're not like putting in an exchange server this week. You not don't have week. like an IT yeah. department <laughs> doing all this stuff for you. Probably not. No. Uh, and I bet you, you uh, for the web managed hosting. You're not like running server farm somewhere. No, it's yeah. all on the web. Yeah, exactly, all in the cloud. So uh, Power VPS is another one of our sponsors, and they provide fully managed virtual private hosting. Uh, as low as $59 a month, go to powervps.com. Twist viewers get 25% off the life of their plan with the discount code TWIST. That should work. Very nice. And uh, so now uh, you haven't raised angel capital before. What's your process going to be for doing that? Do you, have a, do you have a strategy for doing that? Have you, have you thought about it? That's a, a great question, um, and you're probably more the expert. Being <laughs> this is my first startup, yeah. uh, you know, we're, we're treading fairly lightly into it, and we've got a lot of different people giving us input about you know, friends and family first, or we want people who are in the industry and you know, have a, can help make those connections for content deals and licensing and yeah. kind of which direction we want to go there. Um, but the licensing deals seem to be coming in at a great, uh, you know, in great numbers. So it'll really be, I don't know, maybe we structure it as a loan because, we, you know, we really only need this money to get that upfront licensing. Yeah. We've proven what we can do with these other books. You're just floating, the lo you're yeah. floating that money until you get the money back from the App Store. How long does the App Store take to pay? We got, so we'll get, um, 
Maze or we'll get Maze check in about a week or to ten days. So, so thirty days. It's about thirty days out. About a yeah. month out yeah. from the close of the month. Yeah. Uh, it's monthly. pretty reasonable. Yeah, yeah a month out. Uh, and I bet you they speed that up to try to get you know developers their money quicker. Uh, yeah, loans are actually a possibility. There, there are bank loans, and if you can yeah. show them, like, and you actually have like legitimate clients, and you say, hey, look, we just we just needed to get these three things, and these three things result in other things. A little harder to get now, I guess, in the market. Um, and then it's friends and family, always good. Uh, if it's a, it's an amount that is not significant to their net worth. Right. If it's amount that's significant to their net worth, then it's going to be an uncomfortable Thanksgiving and unnecessary tension. There are people in the industry who know either licensing or know uh, mobile, and then could probably add value. Like right. you're saying, like a content person is going to add much more value. How does the new uh, book format impact your format, or does it? The new book format, like the, the you know the iPad has its book format. All oh, right. Yeah, and so we don't. There were a lot of there's. Books are, I think, the most crowded, right next to games, as far as volume of applications. Um, almost 200,000 apps. There's something ridiculous like 30, 40,000 books. A lot of those are just text-based readers, um, and we've never wanted to compete there. The, the iBook is great. Um, there's a lot of other great readers out there you can get on your iPad. Yeah. But they don't do things like offer the full screen images with the audio component and the highlighted text, yeah. things you have to do in an app. Right. So our picture books and our age category is going to need the app in order to deliver it in a way yeah. that makes sense to them. Just, it's not competitive yet. Right. It's when you, if you went to the older category, maybe it would be yeah. a little bit more competitive. Yeah. But you can publish in that format if you wanted to, I guess. Yeah, if, and for those books that do fit in those EPUB requirements, I think that yeah. the other readers are a, a better way to go. I hear a lot of uh, debate about how you stand out in the app store and how you get your stuff known. It seems to be alchemy to get your app to rank, and there's a lot of game playing that seems to be going on. Uh, what kind of tricks are people doing to get their apps to move up? I mean, you have one thing in your favor that it's a known character, it's a known entity, so right. that people might search for it to just to see what's there, I guess. Is that correct? Do people just type in Shrek because they see the movie's out? Yeah, and the uh, Shrek card has been a tremendously popular app, so people are, yeah. have been searching Shrek and buying Shrek stuff for a while. The How yeah. to Train Your Dragon was interesting because that it was a property that's never been done before. Um, right. We had one of the first apps around that, and that did really well. Um, but as far as getting that exposure, I mean, I think, again, the content is king. Yeah. Um, if you have something that both works really well, has the it's marketable yeah. and it looks good, you know how concerned Apple is with design, um, yeah. then I think you have a, a better chance. But there's just so many apps out there. It is paramount, you're right, yeah. getting that exposure in the app. And so maybe huge. if you have something that's high profile, there's somebody at Apple you can be, make aware that it's coming out or something? Is, is, do you guys have, have all kinds of email addresses that you can promote stuff, stuff to? to that you, May maybe may get you listed. Back. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's sort of like that because I know we've been promoted. The show here this week in Star has been promoted. Kevin Pollock's show got promoted on iTunes, and it was like this very weird thing where like all of a sudden we're promoted, but we don't know exactly how. Right. Uh, I guess they just curate the list and look for things that are interesting. You've got great stuff. Yeah. Um, there are some third-party companies though going around trying to help people market in the app store. Have you tried any of those or thought about them? They... We haven't used those yet. Yeah. Um, we've really focused on just getting in traditional press and online press bloggers, um, ah, trying bloggers, to go yeah. after the mommy bloggers, um, distribute to them, give them download codes, give them a chance to look ah. and write about it. Yeah. Um, and that's been really helpful. That's probably second to being featured in the App Store, getting written up in the either old mommy or press. bloggers, yeah. which is really a force now. They are the mommy bloggers. They like real trendsetters and. Yeah, uh, and they have they have uh, listeners who buy, right? So uh, they're and good clout. ears. Yeah. Uh, thanks for being on the program. Awesome stuff. Continued success. And if people want to find your website, because they'll probably be watching uh, in front of their computers, what's the what's the website? iStoryTime.com. I the letter I Storytime.com. And if they want to see the application, they, just, they can type in Shrek. Exactly. And it's there. Yeah. It's one of the two Shrek apps in the App Store. There's actually six Shrek apps now, but huh. we're the only book. Um, yeah. There's a comic even that's out there. Oh, really? Um, 
but it seems like the the picture book and the game are the ones that really have have done the most as far as sales numbers go. Awesome. Uh, and thank you to uh, WebSpy for sponsoring the show as well. Monitor all kinds of server activity from employee internet access to mail service to web host. Analyze your traffic levels, patterns, errors, and more. It's a total log analysis solution. Uh, if you're watching the program, just thank them on Twitter, at WebSpy, at DNA Mail, at Power VPS, and at Ustream. Thank you. And we'll see you next time on This Week in Startups. Spiked out, I could trip a referee. Tell by my attitude that I most definitely leave from. No.